chapter fourteen of holiday house this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org holiday house by catherine sinclair chapter fourteen the unexpected event his shout may ring upon the hill his voice be echoed in the hall his merry laugh like music trill i scarcely notice such things now willis some weeks after frank had left home while lady harriet and major graham were absent at holiday house harry and laura felt surprised to observe that mrs crabtree suddenly became very grave and silent her voice seemed to have lost half its loudness her countenance looked rather pale and they both escaped being scolded on several occasions when harry himself could not but think he deserved it once or twice he ventured to do things that at other times he dared not have attempted merely as an experiment he said like that man in the menagerie who put his head into the lion's mouth without feeling quite sure whether it would be bit off the next moment or not but though mrs crabtree evidently saw all that passed she turned away with a look of sadness and said not a word what could be the matter harry almost wished she would fly into a good passion and scold him it became so extraordinary and unnatural to see mrs crabtree sitting all day in a corner of the room sewing in silence and scarcely looking up from her work but still the wonder grew for she seemed to become worse and worse every day harry dressed up the cat in an old cap and frock of laura's he terrified old jowler by putting him into the shower-bath and let off a few crackers at the nursery window but it seemed as if he might have fired a cannon without being scolded by mrs crabtree who merely turned her head round for a minute and then silently resumed her work laura even fancied that mrs crabtree was once in tears but that seemed quite impossible so she thought no more about it till one morning when they had begun to despair of ever hearing more about the business and were whispering together in a corner of the room observing that she looked duller than ever they were surprised to hear mrs crabtree calling them both to come near her she looked very pale and was beginning to say something when her voice suddenly became so husky and indistinct that she seemed unable to proceed therefore motioning with her hand for them to go away she began sewing very rapidly as she had done before breaking her threads and pricking her fingers at every stitch laura and harry silently looked at each other with some apprehension and the nursery now became so perfectly still that a feather falling on the ground would have been heard this had continued for some time when at last laura upon tiptoe stole quietly up to where mrs crabtree was sitting and said to her in a very kind and anxious voice i am afraid you are not well mrs crabtree grandmamma will send for a doctor when she comes home shall i ask her you are very kind miss laura never mind me your grandmamma knows what is the matter it will be all one a hundred years hence answered mrs crabtree in a low husky voice this is a thing you will be very glad to hear you must prepare to be told some good news added she forcing a laugh but such a laugh as harry and laura never heard before for it sounded so much more like sorrow than joy they waited in great suspense to hear what would follow but mrs crabtree after struggling to speak again with composure suddenly started off her seat and hurried rapidly out of the room she appeared no more in the nursery that day but next morning when they were at breakfast she entered the room with her face very much covered up in her bonnet and evidently tried to speak in her usual loud bustling voice though somehow it still sounded perfectly different from common well children lady harriet was so kind as to promise that my secret should be kept till i pleased and that no one should mention it to you but myself 
i am going away you exclaimed harry looking earnestly in mrs crabtree's face are you going away yes master harry i leave this house to-day now don't pretend to look sorry i know you are not i can't bear children to tell stories who would ever be sorry for a cross old woman like me but perhaps i am sorry are you in real earnest going away asked harry again with renewed astonishment oh no it is only a joke do i look as if this were a joke asked mrs crabtree turning round her face which was bathed with tears no no i am come to bid you both a long farewell a fine mess you will get into now all your things going to rack and ruin with nobody fit to look after them but mrs crabtree we do not like you to go away said laura kindly why are you leaving us all on a sudden it is very odd i never was so surprised in my life your papa's orders are come he wrote me a line some weeks ago to say that i have been too severe perhaps that is all true i meant it well and we are poor creatures who can only act for the best however it can't be helped now there's no use in lamenting over spilt cream you'll be the better behaved afterwards if ever you think of me again children let it be as kindly as possible many and many a time i shall remember you both i never cared for any young people but yourselves and i shall never take charge of any others master frank was the best boy in the world and you would both have been as good under my care but it is no matter now but it does matter a very great deal cried harry eagerly you must stay here mrs crabtree as long as you live and a great deal longer i shall write a letter to papa all about it we were very troublesome and it was our own faults if we were punished never mind mrs crabtree but take off your bonnet and sit down i am going to do some dreadful mischief to-night so you will be wanted to keep me in order mrs crabtree laid her hand upon harry's head in silence and there was something so solemn and serious in her manner that he saw it would be useless to remonstrate any more she then held out her hand to laura endeavouring to smile as she did so but it was a vain attempt for her lip quivered and she turned away saying who would ever believe i should make such a fool of myself farewell to you both and let nobody speak ill of me after i am gone if you can help it without looking round mrs crabtree hurried out of the nursery and closed the door leaving harry and laura perfectly bewildered with astonishment at this sudden event which seemed more like a dream than a reality they both felt exceedingly melancholy hardly able to believe that she had formerly been at all cross while they stood at the window with tears in their eyes watching the departure of her well-known blue chest on a wheelbarrow and taking a last look of her red gown and scarlet shawl as she hastily followed it for several weeks to come whenever the door opened harry and laura almost expected her to enter but month after month elapsed and mrs crabtree appeared no more till one day at their earnest entreaty lady harriet took them a drive of some miles into the country to see the neat little lodging by the seaside where she lived and maintained herself by sewing and by going out occasionally as a sick nurse a more delightful surprise certainly never could have been given than when harry and laura tapped at the cottage door which was opened by mrs crabtree herself who started back with an exclamation of joyful amazement and looked as if she could scarcely believe her eyes on beholding them while they laughed at the joke till tears were running down their cheeks is mrs crabtree at home said harry trying to look very grave grandmamma says we may stay here for an hour while she drives along the shore added laura stepping into the house with a very merry face and how do you do mrs crabtree very well miss laura and very happy to see you what a tall girl you are become and master harry too looking quite over his own shoulders 
after sitting some time mrs crabtree insisted on their having some dinner in her cottage so making harry and laura sit down on each side of a large blazing fire she cooked some most delicious pancakes for them in rapid succession as fast as they could eat tossing them high in the air first and then rolling up each as it was fried with a large spoonful of jam in the centre till harry and laura at last said that unless mrs crabtree supplied fresh appetites she need make no more pancakes for they thought even peter gray himself could scarcely have finished all she provided harry had now been several months constantly attending school where he became a great favourite with the boys and a great torment to the masters while for his own part he liked it twenty times better than he had expected because the lessons were tolerably easy to a clever boy as he really was and the games at cricket and football in the playground put him perfectly wild with joy every boy at school seemed to be his particular friend and many called him the holiday-maker because if ever a holiday was wished for harry always became leader in the scheme the last morning of peter gray's appearing at school he got the name of the copper captain because mr lexicon having fined him half a crown for not knowing one of his lessons he brought the whole sum in halfpence carrying them in his hat and gravely counting them all out with such a painstaking good boy look that any one to see him would have supposed he was quite penitent and sorry for his misconduct but no sooner had he finished the task and ranged all the halfpence neatly in rows along mr lexicon's desk than he was desired in a voice of thunder to leave the room instantly and never to return which accordingly he never did having started next day on the top of the coach for portsmouth and the last peep harry got of him he was buying a perfect mountain of gingerbread out of an old man's basket to eat by the way meantime laura had lessons from a regular day governess who came every morning at seven and never disappeared till four in the afternoon so as mrs crabtree remarked the pure thing was perfectly deaved with education but she made such rapid progress that uncle david said it would be difficult to decide whether she was growing fastest in body or in mind laura seemed born to be under the tuition of none but ill-tempered people and madame pirouette appeared in a constant state of irritability during the music lesson she sat close to the piano with a pair of sharp pointed scissors in her hand and whenever laura played a wrong note she stuck their points into the offending finger saying sometimes in an angry foreign accent put your toe upon dis note i tell you put your toe upon dis note my finger i suppose you mean asked laura trying not to laugh ah finger and toe that is all one speak not a word take hold of your tongue laura said major graham one day i would as soon hear a gong sounded at my ear for half an hour as most of the fine pieces you perform now taste and expression are quite out of date but the chief object of ambition is to seem as if you had four hands instead of two from the torrent of notes produced at once if ever you wish to please my old-fashioned ears give me melody something that touches the heart and dwells in the memory then years afterwards when we hear it again the language seems familiar to our feelings and we listen with deep delight to sounds recalling a thousand recollections of former days which are brought back by music real music with distinctness and interest which nothing else can equal during more than two years while harry and laura were rapidly advancing in education they received many interesting letters from frank expressing the most affectionate anxiety to hear of their being well and happy while his paper was filled with amusing accounts of the various wonderful countries he visited and at the bottom of the paper he always very kindly remembered to send them an order on his banker as he called uncle david drawn up in proper form saying please to pay master harry and miss laura graham the sum of five shillings on my account francis arthur graham 
in frank's gay merry epistles he kept all his little annoyances or vexations to himself and invariably took up the pen with such a desire to send cheerfulness into his own beloved home that his letters might have been written with a sunbeam they were so full of warmth and vivacity it seemed always a fair wind to frank for he looked upon the best side of everything and never teased his absent friends with complaints of distresses they could not remedy except when he frequently mentioned his sorrow at being separated from them adding that he often wished it were possible to meet them during one day in every year to tell all his thoughts and to hear theirs in return for sometimes now during the night watches when all other resources failed he entertained himself by imagining the circle of home all gathered around him and by inventing what each individual would say upon any subjects he liked while all his adventures acquired a double interest from considering that the recital would one day amuse his dear friends when their happy meeting at last took place frank was not so over-anxious about his own comfort as to feel very much irritated and discomposed at any privations that fell in his way and once sitting up in the middle of a dark night with the rain pouring in torrents and the wind blowing a perfect hurricane he drew his watch-coat round him saying good-humouredly to his grumbling companions this is by no means so bad and whatever change takes place now will probably be for the better sunshine is as sure to come as christmas if you only wait for it and in the meantime we are all more comfortably off than st patrick when he had to swim across a stormy sea with his head under his arm frank often amused his messmates with stories which he had heard from uncle david and soon became the greatest favourite imaginable with them all while he frequently endeavoured to lead their minds to the same sure foundation of happiness which he always found the best security of his own he had long been taught to know that a vessel might as well be steered without rudder or compass as any individual be brought into a haven of peace unless directed by the holy scriptures and his delight was frequently to study such passages as these when thou passest through the waters i will be with thee and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee when thou walkest through the fire thou shalt not be burned neither shall the flame kindle upon thee for i am the lord thy god the holy one of israel thy saviour end of chapter fourteen the unexpected event chapter fifteen of holiday house this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Holiday House by Catherine Sinclair Chapter 15 An Unexpected Voyage Full little knowest thou that hast not tried How strange it is in steamboat long to bide To fret thy soul with crosses and with cares To eat thy heart through comfortless despairs to speed to-day to be put back to-morrow to feed on hope to pine with fear and sorrow spencer as harry and laura grew older they were gradually treated like friends and companions by lady harriet and major graham who improved their minds by frequent interesting conversations in which knowledge and principle were insensibly instilled into their minds not by formal instruction but merely by mentioning facts or expressing opinions and sentiments such as naturally arose out of the subjects under discussion and accustoming the young people themselves to feel certain that their own remarks and thoughts were to be heard with the same interest as those of any other person no surprise was expressed if they appeared more acute or more amusing than might have been expected no angry contempt betrayed itself if they spoke foolishly unless it were something positively wrong and thus major graham and lady harriet succeeded in making that very difficult transition from treating children as toys to becoming their confidential friends and most trusted as well as most respected and beloved associates 
frank had been upwards of five years cruising on various stations abroad and many officers who had seen him gave such agreeable reports to major graham of his admirable conduct on several occasions and of his having turned out so extremely handsome and pleasing that lady harriet often wished with tears in her eyes it were possible she might live to see him once again though her own daily increasing infirmities rendered that hope every hour more improbable she was told that he spoke of her very frequently and said once when he met an aged person at the cape i would give all i possess on earth and ten times more if i had it to see my dear grandmother as well and to meet her once more this deeply affected lady harriet who was speaking one day with unusual earnestness of the comfort it gave whatever might be the will of providence in respect to herself that frank seemed so happy and liked his profession so well when the door flew open and andrew hastened into the room his old face perfectly wrinkled with delight while he displayed a letter in his hand saying in a tone of breathless agitation as he delivered it to major graham the postmark is portsmouth sir lady harriet nearly rose from her seat with an exclamation of joy but unable for the exertion she sunk back covering her face with her hands and listening in speechless suspense to hear whether frank had indeed returned harry and laura eagerly looked over major graham's shoulder and andrew lingered anxiously at the door till this welcome letter was hurriedly torn open and read the direction was certainly frank's writing though it seemed very different from usual but the contents filled major graham with a degree of consternation and alarm which he vainly endeavoured to conceal for it informed him that during a desperate engagement with some slave ships off the coast of africa frank had been most severely wounded from which he scarcely recovered before a violent attack of fever reduced him so extremely that the doctors declared his only chance of restoration was to be invalided home immediately therefore added he you must all unite a prayer for my recovery with a thanksgiving for my return and i can scarcely regret an illness that restores me to home my heart is already with you all but my frail shattered body must rest some days in london as the voyage from sierra leone has been extremely fatiguing and tedious lady harriet made not a single remark when this letter was closed but tears coursed each other rapidly down her aged cheeks while she slowly removed her hands from her face and gazed at major graham who seated himself by her side in evident agitation and calling back andrew when he was leaving the room he said in accents of unusual emotion desire john to inquire immediately whether any steamboat sails for london to-day you are right said lady harriet feebly oh that i could accompany you but bring him to me if possible i dare not hope to go surely we shall meet at last now indeed i feel my own weakness when i cannot fly to see him but he will be quite able for the journey frank had an excellent constitution he he was lady harriet's voice failed and she burst into a convulsive agony of tears a few hours and uncle david had embarked for london where after a short passage he arrived at his usual lodgings in st james place but some days elapsed during which he laboured in vain to discover the smallest trace of frank who had omitted in his hurried letter from portsmouth to mention where he intended living in town one evening fatigued with his long and unavailing search major graham sat down at the british coffee-house to take some refreshment before resuming his inquiries and was afterwards about to leave the room when he observed a very tall interesting young man exceedingly emaciated who strolled languidly into the room with so feeble a step that he scarcely seemed able to support himself the stranger took off his hat sunk into a seat and passed his fingers through the dark masses of curls that hung over his pale white forehead his large eyes closed heavily with fatigue his cheek assumed a hectic glow and his head sunk upon his hand in a low subdued voice he gave some directions to the waiter and major graham after gazing for a moment with melancholy interest at this apparently consumptive youth was about to depart 
when a turn of the young man's countenance caused him to start he looked again more earnestly every fibre of his frame seemed suddenly to thrill with apprehension and at last in a voice of doubt and astonishment he exclaimed frank the stranger sprung from his seat gazed eagerly round the room rushed into the arms of major graham and fainted long and anxiously did uncle david watch for the restoration of frank while every means were used to revive him and when at length he did regain his consciousness no time was lost in conveying him to st james place where after being confined to bed and attended by sir astley cooper and sir henry halford during some days they united in recommending that he should be carried some miles out of town to the neighbourhood of hammersmith for change of air till the effect of medicine and diet could be fully tried frank earnestly entreated that he might be taken immediately to his own home but this the doctors pronounced quite impossible privately hinting to major graham that it seemed very doubtful indeed whether he could ever be moved there at all or whether he might survive above a few months home is anywhere that my own family live with me said frank in a tone of resignation when he heard a journey to scotland pronounced impossible it is not where i am but who i see that signifies and this meeting with you uncle david did me more good than an ocean of physic oh if i could only converse with grandmamma for half an hour and speak to dear harry and lore it would be too much happiness i want to see how much they are both grown and to hear their merry laugh again perhaps i never may but if i get worse they must come here i have many things to say why should they not set off now immediately if i recover we might be such a happy party to scotland again for grandmamma i know it is impossible but will you write and ask her about harry and lore the sooner the better uncle david because i often think it probable frank coloured and hesitated he looked earnestly at his uncle for some moments who saw what was meant and then added there is one person more far distant and little thinking of what is to come who must be told you have always been a father to me uncle david but he also would wish to be here now little as we have been together i know how much he loves me frank's request became no sooner known than it was complied with by lady harriet who thought it better not to distress harry and laura by mentioning the full extent of his danger but merely said that he felt impatient for the meeting and that they might prepare on the following day to embark under charge of old andrew and her own maid harrison for a voyage to london where she hoped they would find the dear invalid already better laura was astonished at the agitation with which she spoke and felt bewildered and amazed by this sudden announcement she and harry had once or twice in their lives caught cold and spent a day in bed confined to a diet of gruel and syrup which always proved an infallible remedy for their very worst attacks and they had frequently witnessed the severe sufferings of their grandmamma from which however she always recovered and which seemed to them the natural effects of her extreme old age but to imagine the possibility of frank's life being in actual danger never crossed their thoughts for an instant and therefore it was with a feeling of unutterable joy that they stood on the deck of the royal pandemonium knowing that they were now actually going to meet frank nothing could be a greater novelty to both the young travellers than the scene by which they were now surrounded trumpets were sounding bells ringing children crying sailors passengers carriages dogs and baggage all hurrying on board pell-mell while a jet of steam came bellowing forth from the waste pipe as if it were struggling to get rid of the huge column of black smoke vomited forth by the chimney below stairs they were still more astonished to find a large cabin covered with gilding red damask and mirrors where crowds of strange-looking people more than half sick and very cross were scolding and bustling about bawling for their carpet-bags and trying to be of as much consequence as possible while they ate and drank trash to keep off seasickness that might have made any one sick on shore sipping brandy and water or eating peppermint drops according as the case required among those in the ladies cabin 
laura and harry were amused to discover miss percival who had hastened into bed already in case of being ill and was talking unceasingly to any one who would listen besides ordering and scolding a poor sick maid scarcely able to stand her head was enveloped in a most singular nightcap ornamented with old ribbons and artificial flowers she wore a bright yellow shawl and had taken into the berth beside her a little blenheim spaniel a parrot and a cage of canary birds the noisy inhabitants of which sung at the full pitch of their voices till the very latest hour of the night being kept awake by the lamp which swung from side to side while nothing could be compared to their volubility except the perpetual clamour occasioned by miss percival herself i declare these little narrow beds are no better than coffins i never saw such places and the smell is like singed blankets and cabbages boiled in melted oil it is enough to make anybody ill mary go and fetch me a cup of tea and do you hear tell those people on deck not to make such noise it gives me a headache be sure you say that i shall complain to the captain reach me some bread and milk for the parrot fetch my smelling bottle go to the saloon for that book i was reading and search again for the pocket handkerchief i mislaid it cost ten guineas and must be found i hope no one has stolen it now do make haste with the tea what are you dawdling there for if you do not stop that noise on deck mary i shall be exceedingly displeased some of those horrid people in the steerage were smoking too but tell the captain that if i come up he must forbid them it is a trick to make us all sick and save provisions i observed a gun case in the saloon too which is a most dangerous thing for guns always go off when you least expect if any one fires i shall fall into hysterics i shall indeed what a creaking noise the vessel makes i hope there is no danger of its splitting we ought not to go on sailing after dusk the captain must positively cast anchor during the night that we may have no more of this noise or motion but sleep in peace and quietness till morning soon after the royal pandemonium had set sail or rather set fire the wind freshened and the pitching of the vessel became so rough that harry and laura with great difficulty staggered to seats on the deck leaving both lady harriet's servants so very sick below that instead of being able to attend on them they gave nine times the trouble that any other passenger did on board and were not visible again during the whole voyage the two young travellers now sat down together and watched with great curiosity several groups of strangers on deck ladies half sick trying to entertain gentlemen in sealskin travelling caps and pale cadaverous countenances smoking cigars others opening baskets of provisions and eating with good seafaring appetite while one party had a carriage on the deck so filled with luxuries of every kind that there seemed no end to the multitude of perigord pies german sausages cold fowls pastry and fruit that were produced during the evening the owners had a table spread on the deck and ate voraciously before a circle of hungry spectators which had such an appearance of selfishness and gluttony that both his young friends thought immediately of peter gray as evening closed in harry and laura began to feel very desolate thus for the first time in their lives alone while the wide waste of waters around made the scene yet more forlorn they had enjoyed unmingled delight in talking over and over about their happy meeting with frank and planned a hundred times how joyfully they would rush into the house and with what pleasure they would relate all that happened to themselves after hearing from his own mouth the extraordinary adventures which his letters had described laura produced from her reticule several of the last she had received and laughed again over the funny jokes and stories they contained inventing many new questions to ask him on the subject and fancying she already heard his voice and saw his bright and joyous countenance but now the night had grown so dark and chilly that both harry and laura felt themselves gradually becoming cold melancholy and dejected they made an effort to walk arm in arm up and down the deck in imitation of the few other passengers who had been able to remain out of bed and they tried still to talk cheerfully but in spite of every effort their thoughts became mournful after clinging together for some time and staggering up and down 
without feeling in spirits to speak they were still shiveringly cold yet unwilling to separate for the night when harry suddenly stood still grasping laura's arm with a look of startled astonishment which caused her hastily to glance round in the direction where he was eagerly gazing but nothing became visible except the dim outline of a woman's figure rolled up in several enormous shawls and with her bonnet slouched far over her face i am certain it was her whispered harry in a tone of breathless amazement almost certain who asked laura eagerly without answering harry sprung forward and seized the unknown person by the arm who instantly looked round it was mrs crabtree i am sorry you observed me master harry i did not intend to trouble you and miss laura during the voyage said she turning her face slowly towards him when to his surprise he saw that the traces of tears were on her cheek and her manner appeared so subdued and altogether so different from former times that laura could scarcely yet credit her senses i shall not be at all in your way children but i-i must see master frank again he was always too good for this world and he'll not be here long andrew told me all about it and i could not stay behind i wish we were all as well prepared and then the sooner we die the better harry and laura listened in speechless consternation to these words the very idea of losing frank had never before crossed their imaginations for a moment and they could have wished to believe that what mrs crabtree said was like the ravings of delirium yet an irresistible feeling of awe and alarm rushed into their minds miss laura if you want any help in undressing call to me at any time i was sure that doited body harrison could be of no service she never was fit to take care of herself and far less of such as you it put me wild to think of your coming all this way with nobody fit to look after you and then the distress that must follow but surely mrs crabtree you do not think frank so very ill asked laura making an effort to recover her voice and speaking in a tone of deep anxiety he had recovered from the fever but is only rather too weak for travelling well miss laura grief always comes too soon and i would have held my tongue had i thought you did not know the worst already if i might order as in former days it would be to send you both down directly out of this heavy fog and cold wind but you may order us mrs crabtree said harry taking her kindly by the hand we are very glad to see you again and i shall do whatever you bid me so you came all this way on purpose for us how very kind master harry i would go round the wide world to serve any one of you who else have i to care for but it was chiefly to see master frank let us hope the best and pray to be prepared for any event that may come all things are ordained for good and we can only make the best of what happens the world must go round it must go round and we can't prevent it harry and laura hung their heads in dismay for there was something agitated and solemn in mrs crabtree's manner which astonished and shocked them so they hurried silently to bed and laura's pillow was drenched with tears of anxiety and distress that night though gradually as she thought of frank's bright colour and sparkling eyes his joyous spirits and unbroken health it seemed impossible that all were so soon to fade away that the wind should have already passed over them and they were gone till by degrees her mind became more calm her hopes grew into certainties she told herself twenty times over that mrs crabtree must be entirely mistaken and at last sunk into a restless agitated slumber next day the sun shone the sky was clear and everything appeared so full of life and joy that harry and laura would have fancied the whole scene with mrs crabtree a distressing dream had they not been awakened to recollection before six in the morning by the sound of her voice angrily rebuking miss percival and other ladies who with too good reason were grumbling at the hardship of sleeping or rather vainly attempting to sleep in such narrow uncomfortable dog holes laura heard mrs crabtree conclude an eloquent oration on the subject of contentment by saying indeed ladies 
many a brave man and nobleman's son too have laid their heads on the green grass fighting for you so we should put up with a hard bed patiently for one night miss percival turned angrily away and summoned her maid to receive a multitude of new directions mary tell the captain that when i looked out last there was scarcely any smoke coming out of the funnel so i am sure he is saving fuel and not keeping good enough fires to carry us on i never knew such shabbiness tell the engineer that i insist on his throwing on more coals immediately bring me some hot water as fast as possible these towels are so coarse i cannot on any account use them after being accustomed to such pocket handkerchiefs as mine at ten guineas each one does become particular can you not find a larger basin this looks like a soup plate and it seems impossible here to get enough of hot water to wash comfortably she should be put into the boiler of the steamboat muttered mrs crabtree i wish them animal magnifying doctors would put the young lady to sleep till we arrive in london now continued miss percival get me another cup of tea the last was too sweet the one before not strong enough and the first half cold but this is worse than any do remember to mention that yesterday night the steward sent up a tin teapot a thing i cannot possibly suffer again we must have the urn too instead of that black tea kettle and desire him to prepare some butter toast i am not hungry so three rounds will be enough let me have some green tea this time and see that the cream is better than last night when i am certain it was thickened with chalk or snails the jelly too was execrable for it tasted like sticking plaster i shall starve if better can't be had and the tablecloth looks like a pair of old sheets tell the steward all this and say he must get my breakfast ready on deck in half an hour but meantime i shall sit here with a book while you brush my hair the sick persecuted maid seemed anxious to do all she was bid so after delivering as many of the messages as possible she tried to stand up and do miss percival's hair but the motion of the vessel had greatly increased and she turned as pale as death apparently on the point of sinking to the ground when laura now quite dressed quietly slipped the brush out of her hand and carefully brushed miss percival's thin locks while poor mary silently dropped upon a seat being perfectly faint with sickness miss percival read on without observing the change of abigail's till harry who had watched this whole scene from the cabin door made a hissing noise such as grooms do when they curry comb a horse which caused the young lady to look hastily round when great was miss percival's astonishment to discover her new abigail with a very painstaking look brushing her hair while poor mary lay more dead than alive on the benches well i declare was there ever anything so odd she exclaimed in a voice of amazement how very strange what can be the matter with mary there is no end to the plague of servants or rather to the plague of mistresses thought laura while she glanced from miss percival's round red bustling face to the poor suffering maid who became worse and worse during the day for there came on what sailors call a capful of wind which gradually rose to a stiff breeze or what the passengers considered a hurricane and towards night it attained the dignity of a real undeniable storm a scene of indescribable tumult then ensued the captain attempted to make his voice heard above the roaring tempest using a torrent of unintelligible nautical phrases and an incessant volley of very intelligible oaths the sailors flew about and every plank in the vessel seemed creaking and straining but high above all the shrill tones of miss percival were audibly heard exclaiming are there enough of hands on board is there any danger are you sure the boiler will not burst i wish steamboats had never been invented people are sure to be blown up to the clouds or sunk to the bottom of the ocean or scalded to death like so many lobsters i cannot stand this any longer stop the ship and set me on shore instantly laura clung closer to harry and felt that they were like two mere pygmies amid the wide waste of waters rolling and tossing around them while his spirits on the contrary rose to the highest pitch of excitement with all he heard and saw till at length wishing to enjoy more of the fun 
he determined to venture above board by the time harry's nose was on a level with the deck he gazed around and saw that not a person appeared visible except two sailors both lashed to the helm while all was silent now except the deafening noise made by the wild waves and the stormy blast which seemed as if it would blow his teeth down his throat harry thought the two men looked no larger than mice in such a scene and stood clinging to the banisters perfectly entranced with astonishment and admiration at the novelty of all he saw and thinking how often frank must have been in such scenes when suddenly a wave washed quite over the deck and he felt his arm grasped by mrs crabtree who desired him to come down immediately in a tone of authority which he did not even yet feel bold enough to disobey therefore slowly and reluctantly he descended to the cabin where the only living thing that seemed well enough to move was miss percival's tongue steward she cried in sharp angry accents steward here is water pouring down the skylights like a shower bath look at my bandbox swimming on the floor mary tiresome creature don't you see that my best bonnet will be destroyed send the captain here he must positively stop that noise on deck it is quite intolerable my head aches as if it would burst like the boiler of a steamboat stupid man can't he put into some port or cast anchor how can he keep us all uncomfortable this way mary mary i say are you deaf steward send one of the sailors here to take care of this dog i declare poor frisk is going to be sick mary mary this is insufferable i wish the captain would come and help me to scold my maid i shall certainly give you warning mary this awful threat had but little effect on one who thought herself on the brink of being buried beneath the waves besides being too sick to care whether she died the next minute or not and even miss percival's voice became drowned at last in the tremendous storm which raged throughout the night during which the captain rather increased laura's panic if that were possible by considerately putting his head into the cabin now and then to say don't be afraid ladies there is no danger but i must come up and see what you are about captain exclaimed miss percival you had better be still ma'am replied mrs crabtree it is as well to be drowned in bed as on deck nothing gives a more awful idea of the helplessness of man and the wrath of god than a tempestuous sea during the gloom of midnight and every mind on board became awed into silence and solemnity during this war of elements till at length towards morning while the hurricane seemed yet raging with undiminished fury laura suddenly gave an exclamation of rapture on hearing a sailor at the helm begin to sing tom bowling now i feel sure the danger is over said she otherwise that man could not have the heart to sing if i live a century i shall always like a sailor's song for the future it is seldom that any person's thankfulness after danger bears a fair proportion to the fear they felt while it lasted but harry and laura had been taught to remember where their gratitude was due and felt it the more deeply next day when they entered the yarmouth roads and were shown the masts of several vessels appearing partly above the water which had on various occasions been lost in that wilderness of shoals where so many melancholy catastrophes have occurred after sailing up the thames and duly staring at greenwich hospital the hulks and the tower of london they landed at last and having offered mrs crabtree a place in the hackney coach they hurried impatiently into it eager for the happy moment of meeting with frank harry in his ardour thought that no carriage had ever driven so slowly before he wished there had been a railroad through the town and far from wasting a thought upon the novelties of holborn or piccadilly he and laura gained no idea of the metropolis more distinct than that of the irishman who complained he could not see london for the quantity of houses one only idea filled their hearts and brightened their countenances while they looked at each other with a smile of delight saying now at last we are going to see frank end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of holiday house 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rosalind Walsh, Newfoundland and Labrador, Canada. Holiday House by Catherine Sinclair. Chapter 16 The Arrival. What is life? A varied tale, deeply moving, quickly told. Willis. Oh, what a lovely cottage! exclaimed Laura in an ecstasy of joy when they stopped before a beautiful house with large airy windows down to the ground, walls that seemed one brilliant mass of roses, rich flowery meadows in front, and a bright smooth lawn behind, stretching down to the broad bosom of the Thames, which reflected on its glassy surface innumerable boats filled with gay groups of merry people. That is such a place as I have often dreamed of, but never saw before. It seems made for perfect happiness. Yes, how delightful to live here with Frank and Uncle David, added Harry. We shall be sailing on the water all day. The cottage gate was now opened, and Major Graham himself appeared under the porch. But instead of hurrying forward, as he always formerly did, to welcome them after the very shortest separation, he stood gravely and silently at the door, without so much as raising his eyes from the ground, and the paleness of his countenance filled both Harry and Laura with astonishment. They flew to meet him, making an exclamation of joy, but after embracing them affectionately, he did not utter a word and led the way with hurried and agitated steps into a sitting-room. "'Where is Frank?' exclaimed Harry, looking eagerly round. "'Why is he not here? Call him down. Tell him we are come.' A long pause ensued, and Laura trembled when she looked at her uncle, who was some moments before he could speak, and sat down, taking each of them by the hand, with such a look of sorrow and commiseration that they were filled with alarm. My dear Harry and Laura, said he solemnly, you have never known grief till now, but if you love me, listen with composure. I have sad news to tell, yet it is of the greatest consequence that you should bear up with fortitude. Frank is extremely ill, and the joy he felt about your coming has agitated him so much that he is worse than you can possibly conceive. It probably depends upon your conduct now whether he survives this night or not. Frank knows you are here. He is impatient for you to embrace him. He becomes more and more agitated every moment the meeting is delayed. Yet if you give way to childish grief, or even to childish joy, upon seeing him again, the doctors think it may cause his immediate death. You might hear his breathing in any part of this house. He is in the lowest extreme of weakness. It will be a dreadful scene for you both. Tell me, Harry and Laura, can you trust yourselves? Can you, for Frank's own sake, enter his room this moment, as quietly as if you had seen him yesterday, and speak to him with composure? Laura felt on hearing these words as if the very earth had opened under her feet, a choking sensation arose in her throat, her color fled, her limbs shook, her whole countenance became convulsed with anguish. But making a resolute effort, she looked anxiously at Harry, and then said in a low, almost inaudible voice, Uncle David, we are able. God will strengthen us. I dare not think a moment. The sooner it is done, the better. Let us go now. Major Graham slowly led the way without speaking, till they reached the bedroom door, where he paused for a moment, while Harry and Laura listened to the gasping sound of Frank struggling for breath. "'Remember, you will scarcely know him,' whispered he, looking doubtfully at Laura's pallid countenance, "'but a single expression of emotion may be fatal. Show your love for Frank now, my dear children. Spare him all agitation.' forget your own feelings for his sake. When Harry and Laura entered the room, Frank buried his face in his hands, 
and leaned them on the table, saying in convulsive accents, "'Go away, Laura! Oh, go away just now! I cannot bear it yet! Leave me! Leave me!' If Laura had been turned into marble at the moment, she could not have seemed more perfectly calm, for her mind was wound up to an almost supernatural effort, and advancing to the place where he sat, without attempting to speak, she took Frank by the hand. Harry did the same, and not a sound was heard for some moments, but the convulsive struggles of Frank himself, while he gasped for breath, and vainly tried to speak, till at length he raised his head and fixed his eyes on Laura, who felt then, for the first time, struck with the dreadful conviction that this meeting was but a prelude to their immediate and final separation. The pale ashy cheek, the hollow eye, the sharp and altered features, all told a tale of anguish such as she had never before conceived, and a cold tremor passed through her frame as she stood amazed and bewildered with grief, while the past, the present, and the future seemed all one mighty heap of agony. Still she gazed steadily on Frank and said nothing, conscious that the smallest indulgence of emotion would bring forth a torrent which nothing could control, and determined, unless her heart ceased to beat, that he should see nothing to increase his agitation. At length, in a low, faint, broken voice, Frank was able to speak, and looking with affectionate sympathy at Laura, he said, Do not think, dear sister, that I always suffer as you see me now. This joy has been too much for me. I shall soon feel easier. Major Graham observed a livid paleness come over Laura's countenance when she attempted to answer, and seeing it was impossible to sustain the trial a moment longer, he made a pretext to hurry her away. Harry instantly followed, and rushing into a vacant room, he threw himself down in an agony of grief and wept convulsively, till the very bed shook beneath him. Hours passed on, and Major Graham left them to exhaust their grief in weeping together, but every moment seemed only to increase their agitation, as the conviction became more fearfully certain that Frank was indeed lost to them for ever. This, then, was the meeting they had so often and so joyously anticipated. Laura sunk upon her knees beside Harry, and prayers were mingled with their tears, while they asked for consolation and tried to feel resigned. Alas, thought she solemnly, how truly did Grandmamma say, if the sorrows of this world are called light afflictions, what must be those from which Christ died to save us? It is merciful that we are not forbid to weep, for, oh, who ever lost such a brother, the kindest, the best of brothers? Dear, dear Frank, can nothing be done? Uncle David, added Laura, clinging to Major Graham when he entered the room, oh, say something to us about Frank getting better. Do you think he will? May we have a hope, one single hope to live upon? that Frank may possibly be spared? Do not turn away. Do not look so very sad. Think how young Frank is, and the doctors are so skillful, and, and, oh, Uncle David, he is dying. I see it. I must believe it, continued she, wringing her hands with grief. You cannot give us one word of hope, though the whole world would be nothing without him. My dear, my very dear Laura, Remember that consoling text in Holy Scripture, Be still, and know that I am God. We have no idea what He can do in saving us from sorrow, or in comforting us when it comes. Therefore let us seek peace from Him, and believe that all shall indeed be ordered well, even though our own hearts were to be broken with affliction. Frank has seen old Nurse Crabtree, and is now in a refreshing sleep. Therefore I wish you to take the opportunity of sitting in his room, and accustoming yourselves, if possible, to the sight of his altered appearance. He is sometimes very cheerful, and always patient. Therefore we must keep up our own spirits, and try to assist him in bearing his sufferings, 
rather than increase them by showing what we feel ourselves i was pleased with you both this morning that meeting was no common effort and now we must show our submission to the divine will difficult as that may be by a deep heartfelt resignation to whatever he ordains harry and laura still felt stupefied with grief but they mechanically followed major graham into frank's room and sat down in a distant corner behind his chair observing with awe and astonishment his pallid countenance his emaciated hands and his drooping figure while scarcely yet able to believe that this was indeed their own beloved frank after they had remained immovably still for some time though shedding many bitter tears as they gazed on the wreck of one so very dear he suddenly started awake and glanced anxiously round the room then with a look of deep disappointment he said to uncle david in low feeble accents it was only a dream i have often dreamed the same thing when far away at sea that would have been too much happiness i fancied harry and laura were here it was no dream dear frank we are here said laura trying to speak in a quiet subdued voice my dear sister then all is well but pray sit always where i can see you after wishing so long for our meeting it appears nearly impossible that we are together at last frank became exhausted with speaking so much but pointed to a seat near himself where harry and laura sat down after which he gazed at them long and earnestly with a look of affectionate pleasure while his smile which had lost all its former cheerfulness was now full of tenderness and sensibility at length his countenance gradually changed while large tears gathered in his eyes and coursed each other silently down his cheeks thoughts of the deepest sadness seemed passing through his mind during some moments but checking the heavy sigh that rose in his breast he riveted his hands together and looked towards heaven with an expression of placid submission saying these words in a scarcely audible tone though evidently addressed to those around weeping endureth for a night but joy cometh in the morning we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle be dissolved we have a building of god an house not made with hands eternal in the heavens weep ye not for the dead neither bemoan him but weep sore for him that goeth away for he shall return no more nor see his native country these words fell upon the ear of harry and laura like a knell of death for they now saw that frank himself believed he was dying and it appeared as if their last spark of hope expired when they heard this terrible dispensation announced from his own lips he seemed anxious now that they should understand his full meaning and receive all the consolation which his mind could afford for he closed his eyes and added in solemn accents i must have died at some time and why not now if i leave friends who are very dear on earth i go to my chief best friend in heaven the whole peace and comfort of my mind rest on thinking of our saviour's merits let us all be ready to say the will of the lord be done think often harry and laura of those words we so frequently repeated to grandmamma formerly take comfort christians when your friends in jesus fall asleep their better being never ends why then dejected weep why inconsolable as those to whom no hope is given death is the messenger of peace and calls my soul to heaven frank's voice failed his head fell back upon the pillows and he remained for a length of time with his eyes closed in solemn meditation and prayer while laura and harry unable so much as to look at each other leaned upon the table and wept in silence laura felt as if she had grown old in a moment as if life could give no more joy as if she herself stood already on the verge of the grave it appeared like a dream that she had ever been happy 
and a dreadful reality to which she was now awakened. Behold, God taketh away, who can hinder him? Who will say unto him, What doest thou? Cease ye from man, whose breath is in his nostrils. These were texts which forced themselves on her mind, with mournful emphasis, while she felt how helpless is earthly affection when the dispensations of God are upon us. All her love for Frank could not avert the stroke of death. All his attachment to her must now be buried in the grave, and the very tenderness they felt for each other only embittered the sorrows of this dreadful moment. From that day Harry and Laura, according to the advice of Uncle David, testified their affection for Frank, not by tears and useless lamentations, though these were not always to be controlled in private, but by the incessant devoted attention with which they watched his looks, anticipated his wishes, and thought every exertion a pleasure which could in the slightest degree contribute to his comfort. Frank, on his part, spared their feelings by often concealing what he suffered, and by speaking of his own death, as if it had been a journey on which he must prepare with readiness to enter, reminding them that never to die was never to be happy, as all they saw him endure from sickness became nothing to what he endured from struggling against sin and temptation, which were the great evils of existence, and that from all these he would be for ever freed by death. Those who are prepared for the challenge, added he solemnly, can neither live too long nor die too soon. For when God gives us his blessing, he then sends heaven, as it were, into the soul before the soul ascends to heaven, and I trust to being gifted with faith and submission for all that may be ordained during my few remaining hours upon earth. Yet with every desire to feel resigned, Frank himself was sometimes surprised out of his usual fortitude, especially when thinking that he must never more hope to see Lady Harriet, towards whom he cast many a longing and affecting thought, saying once, with deep emotion, If I could only see Grandmamma again, I should feel quite well. One evening, as he sat near an open window, gazing on the rich tints of twilight, and breathing with more than usual ease, a wandering musician paused with her guitar, and sung several airs with great pathos and expression. At length she played the tune of Home Sweet Home, to which Frank listened for some moments with intense agitation, till, clasping his hands and bursting into tears, he exclaimed in accents of powerful emotion, Home, that happy home, oh, never, never more, my home is in the grave. Laura wept convulsively while he added in broken accents, I shall still be remembered, still lamented. You must not love me too well, Laura, not as I love you, or your sorrow would be too great. But long hence, when Harry and you are happy together, surrounded with friends, think sometimes of one who must for ever be absent, who loved you better than them all, whose last prayer will be for you both. Oh, who can tell what my feelings are? I can do nothing now but cause distress and anguish to those who love me best. Frank, I would not exchange your affection for the wealth of worlds. As long as I live, it will be my greatest earthly happiness to have had such a brother. And if I were to suffer a sorrow that I cannot name, and dare not think of, you are teaching me how to bear it and leaving us the only comfort we can have in knowing that you are happy. Many plans and many hopes I had for the future, Laura, added Frank, but there is no future for me now in this world. Perhaps I may escape a multitude of sorrows, but how gladly would I have shared all yours, and ensured my best happiness by uniting with Harry and you in living to God. If you both learn more by my death, than by my life, then indeed I do rejoice. With respect to myself, it matters but little a few years or hours sooner, for I may say, in the words of Job, Though he slay me, 
yet will I trust in him. Frank's sufferings increased every day, and became so very great at last, that the doctor proposed giving him strong doses of laudanum, to bring on a stupor and allay the pain. But when this was mentioned to him, he said, I know it is my duty to take whatever you prescribe, and I certainly shall, but if we can do without opiates, let me entreat you to refrain from them. Often formerly at sea I used to think it very sad how few of those I attended in sickness were allowed by the physician to die in possession of their senses on account of being made to take laudanum, which gave them false spirits and temporary ease. Let me retain my faculties as long as they are mercifully granted to me. I can bear pain. At least God grant me strength to do so but I cannot willingly enter the presence of my Creator in a state little short of intoxication. Many days of agony followed this resolution on the part of Frank, but though the medicine which would have brought some hours of oblivion lay within reach, he persevered in wishing to preserve his consciousness, whatever suffering it might cost, and though now and then a prayer for bodily relief was wrung from him in his acute agony, the most frequent and fervent supplications that he uttered night and day were, in an accent of intense emotion, God have mercy upon my soul. Harry and Laura were surprised to find the fields and walks near London so very rural and beautiful as they appeared at Hammersmith, and to meet with much more simplicity and kindness among the common people than they had anticipated. The poorer neighbors who became aware of their affliction testified a degree of sympathy which frequently astonished them and was often afterwards remembered with pleasure, one instant of which seemed peculiarly touching to Laura. Frank always suffered most acutely during the night, and seldom closed his eyes in sleep till morning. Therefore she invariably remained with him to beguile those weary hours while any remonstrance on his part against so fatiguing a duty became a mere waste of words, as she only grew sadder and paler, saying, there would be time enough to take care of herself when she could no longer be of use to him. The earliest thing that gave any relief to Frank's cough every day generally was a tumbler of milk, warm from the cow, which had been ordered for him, and was brought almost as soon as the dawn of light. Once, when Frank had been unusually ill, and sighed in restless agony till morning, Laura watched impatiently for day, and when the milkman was seen at six o'clock, slowly trudging through the fields, and advancing leisurely towards the house, Laura hurried eagerly down to meet him, exclaiming in accents of joy, while she held out the tumbler, "'Oh, I am so glad you are come at last!' "'At last, miss!' "'I am as early as usual,' replied he gruffly. "'It's not many poor folks that gets up so soon to their work, "'and if you had to labour as hard as me all day, "'you would maybe think the morning came too soon.' "'I am seldom in bed all night,' answered Laura sadly. "'My poor sick brother cannot rest till this milk is brought, "'and I wait with him hour after hour till daylight, "'wearying for you to come.' The old dairyman looked with sorrowful surprise at Laura, while she, thinking no more of what had passed, hurried away. But next morning, when sitting up again with Frank, she became surprised to observe the milkman a whole hour earlier than usual, plodding along towards his cattle at a peculiarly rapid pace. He stayed not more than five minutes, only milking one cow, though all the others gathered round him and as soon as he had filled his little pail, he came straight toward Major Graham's cottage, and knocked at the door. Laura instantly ran down to thank him with her whole heart for his kind attention, after which, as long as Frank continued ill, the old dairyman rose long before his usual time to bring this welcome refreshment. Frank desired Laura to beg that he would not take so much trouble or else to insist on his accepting some remuneration, but the old man would neither discontinue the custom nor receive any recompense. 
let me see this kind good dairyman to thank him myself said frank one night when he felt rather easier and next morning laura invited poor teddy collins to walk upstairs who looked exceedingly astonished though very much pleased at the proposal saying may be ma'am the poor young gentleman would not like to see a stranger like me no one is a stranger who feels for him as you have done replied laura leading the way and frank's countenance lighted up with a smile of pleasure when they entered his room he held out his thin emaciated hand to teddy who looked earnestly and sorrowfully in his face as he grasped hold of it saying you look very poorly sir i'm afraid indeed you are sadly ill that i am as ill as any one can be on this side of eternity my tale is told my days are numbered but i would not go out of this world without saying how grateful we both feel for your attention as a cup of cold water given in christian kindness shall hereafter be rewarded i trust also that your attention to me may not be forgotten you are heartily welcome sir it is a great honour for a poor old man like me to oblige anybody i shall not long be able for work now seeing that i am upwards of three score and ten and my days are already full of labour and sorrow to both of us then the night is far spent and the day is at hand replied frank how strange it seems that old as you are i am still older my feeble frame will be sooner worn out and my body laid at rest in the grave let me hope that you have already applied your heart to wisdom for every child of earth must sooner or later find how short is everything but eternity while i appear before you here as a spectacle of mortality think how soon and how certainly you must follow may you then find as i do that even in the last extreme of sickness and sorrow there is comfort in looking forward to such blessings as eye hath not seen nor ear heard farewell my kind friend in this world we shall meet no more but there is another and a better the old man apparently unwilling to withdraw paused for some moments after frank had ceased to speak he muttered a few inaudible words in reply and then slowly and sorrowfully left the room while frank's head sunk languidly on the pillows and laura retired to her room where as usual she wept herself to sleep when harry and laura first arrived at hammersmith frank felt anxious that they should walk out every day for the benefit of their health but finding that each made frequent excuses for remaining constantly with him at home he invented a plan which induced them to take exercise regularly being early in june strawberries were yet so exceedingly rare that they could scarcely be had for any money but the doctor had allowed his patient to eat fruit frank asked his two young attendants to wander about in quest of gardens where a few strawberries could be got and to bring him some accordingly they set out one morning and after a long unsuccessful search at last observed a small greenhouse near the road with one little basket in the window scarcely larger than a thimble containing two or three delicious king seedlings perfectly ripe these were to be sold for five shillings but hardly waiting to ascertain the price laura seized this welcome prize with delight and paid for it on the spot every morning afterwards her regular walk was to hasten with harry towards this pretty little shop where they talked to the gardener about poor frank being so very ill and told him that this fine fruit was wanted for their sick brother at home one day the invalid seemed so much worse than usual that neither harry nor laura could bear to leave him a moment so they requested mrs crabtree to fetch the strawberries which she readily agreed to do but on drawing out her purse in the shop and saying that she came to buy that little basket of fruit at the window what was her astonishment when the gardener looked civil and sorry answering that he would not sell those strawberries if she offered him a guinea apiece no exclaimed mrs crabtree getting into a rage then what do you put them up at the window for there is no use pretending to keep a shop if you will not sell what is in it 
give me these strawberries this minute and here's your five shillings it's quite impossible replied the gardener holding back the basket you see ma'am every day last week a little master and miss came to this here shop buying my strawberries for a young gentleman who is very ill and they look both so sweet and so mournful like that i would not disappoint them for all the world they seem later to-day than usual and are maybe not coming at all but if i lose my day's profits it can't be helped they shall not walk here for nothing if they please to come when mrs crabtree explained that she belonged to the same family as harry and laura the gardener looked hard at her to see if she were attempting to deceive him but feeling convinced that she spoke the truth he begged her to carry off the basket to his young friends positively refusing to take the price end of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of holiday house this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by rosalind walsh newfoundland and labrador canada holiday house by catherine sinclair chapter seventeen the last birthday mere human power shall fast decay and youthful vigour cease but they who wait upon the lord in strength shall still increase frank felt no unnatural apathy or indifference about dying for he looked upon it with awe though not with fear nor did he express any rapturous excitement on the solemn occasion knowing that death is an appointed penalty for transgression which though deprived of its sharpest sting by the triumphs of the cross yet awfully testifies to all succeeding generations that each living man has individually merited the utmost wrath of god and that the last moment on earth of even the most devoted christian must be darkened by the gloom of our original sin and natural corruption yet as in adam all die so in christ all are made alive and amidst the throng of consolatory and affecting meditations that crowded into his mind on the great subject of our salvation he kept a little book in which were carefully recorded such texts and reflections as he considered likely to strengthen his own faith and to comfort those he left behind saying one day to major graham tell grandmamma that though my days have been few upon the earth they were happy when you think of me uncle david after my sufferings are over it may well be a pleasing remembrance that you were always the best the kindest of friends oh how kind but i must not cannot speak of that this is my birthday my last birthday many a joyous one we kept together but those merry days are over and these sadder ones too shall cease yet the time is fast approaching so welcome to us both when death divided friends at last shall meet to part no more in the evening major graham observed that frank made mrs crabtree bring everything belonging to him and lay it on the table when he employed himself busily in tying up a number of little parcels remarking with a languid smile my possessions are not valuable but these are for some old friends and messmates who will be pleased to receive a trifling memorial of one who loved them send my dirk to peter gray who is much reformed now here are all the letters any of you ever sent me how very often they have been read but now even that intercourse must end keep them for they were the dearest treasures i possessed at madras formerly i remember hearing of a nabob who was bringing his whole fortune home in a chest of gold but the ropes for hoisting his treasure on board were so insufficient that the whole gave way and it fell into the ocean never to be recovered that seemed a very sudden termination of his hopes and plans but scarcely more unexpected than my own 
we are a wind that passeth away and cometh not again many restless nights are ordained for me now probably that i may find no resource but prayer and meditation others can afford time to slumber but i so soon shall sleep the sleep of death that it becomes a blessing to have such hours of solitary thought for preparing my heart and establishing my faith during this moment of need yes frank but your prayers are not solitary for ours are joined to yours added laura i read in an old author lately that christian friends in this world might be compared to travellers going along the same road in separate carriages sometimes they are together often they are apart sometimes they can exchange assistance as we do now and often they jostle against each other till at last having reached the journey's end they are removed out of these earthly vehicles into a better state where they shall look back upon former circumstances and know even as they are known laura was often astonished to observe the change which had taken place in her own character and feelings within the very short period of their distress her extreme terror of a thunderstorm formerly had occasioned many a jest to her brothers when harry used occasionally to roll heavy weights in the room above her own to imitate the loudest peals while frank sometimes endeavoured to argue her out of that excessive apprehension with which she listened to the most distant surmise of a storm now however at hammersmith long after midnight the moon on one occasion became completely obscured by dense heavy clouds and the air felt so oppressively hot that frank who seemed unusually breathless drew closer to the window laura supported his head and was deeply occupied in talking to him when suddenly a broad flash of lightning glared into the room followed by a crash of thunder that seemed to crack the very heavens again and again the lightning gleamed in her face with such vividness that laura fancied she could distinguish the heat of it and yet she stirred not nor did a single exclamation as in former days arise on her lips pray shut the window laura said frank languidly raising his eyes and be so kind as to close the shutters why frank you never used to be alarmed by thunder no nor am i now dear laura what danger need a dying person fear some few hours sooner or later would be of little consequence come he slow or come he fast it is but death that comes at last yet laura do you think i have forgotten old times oh no not while i live you attend to my feelings and surely it is my duty to remember yours never mind me frank whispered laura i have got over all that folly when real fears and sorrows come we care no more about those that were imaginary true my dear sister and there is no courage or fortitude like that derived from faith in a superintending providence though all creation real we may sleep in peace for to christians danger is safe and tumult calm when frank grew worse he became often delirious yet as in health he had been habitually cheerful his mind generally wandered to agreeable subjects he fancied himself walking on the bright meadows and picking flowers by the river-side meeting lady harriet and even speaking to his father as if sir edward had been present while harry and laura listened weeping and trembling to behold the wreck of such a mind and heart as his one evening he seemed unusually well and requested that his armchair might be wheeled to the open window where he gazed with delight at the hills and meadows the clouds and glittering water the cattle standing in the stream the boats reflected on its surface and the roses fluttering at every casement those joyous little birds their song makes me cheerful said he in a tone of placid enjoyment i have been in countries where the birds never sing and the leaves never fade but they excited no sympathy or interest here we have notes of gladness both in sunshine and storm teaching us a lesson of grateful contentment while those drooping roses preach a sermon to me 
for as easily might they recover freshness and bloom as myself we shall both lie low before long in the dust yet a spring shall come hereafter to revive even the ashes of the urn then uncle david we meet again not as now amidst sorrow and suffering with death and separation before us but blessed by the consciousness that our sins are forgiven our trials all ended and that our afflictions which were but for a moment have worked out for us a far more exceeding even an eternal weight of glory some hours afterwards the doctor entered after receiving a cordial welcome from frank and feeling his pulse he instantly examined his arms and neck which were covered entirely over with small red spots upon observing which the friendly physician suddenly changed countenance and stole an alarmed glance at major graham i feel easier and better to-day doctor than at any time since my illness said frank looking earnestly in his face do you think this eruption will do me good life has much that would be dear to me while i have friends like these to live for can it be possible that i may yet recover the doctor turned away unable to reply while frank intensely watched his countenance and then gazed at the pale agitated face of major graham gradually the hope which had brightened in his cheek began to fade the lustre of his eye became dim his countenance settled into an expression of mournful resignation and covering his face with his hands he said in a voice of deep emotion i see how it is god's will be done the silence of death succeeded while frank laid his head on the pillow and closed his eyes a few natural tears coursed each other slowly down his cheek but at length an hour or two afterwards being completely exhausted he fell into a gentle sleep from which the doctor considered it very doubtful if he would ever awaken as the red spots indicated mortification which must inevitably terminate his life before next day laura retired to the window making a strenuous effort to restrain her feelings that she might be enabled to witness the last awful scene and fervently did she pray for such strength to sustain it with fortitude as might still render her of some use to her dying brother her pale countenance might almost have been mistaken for that of a corpse but for the expression of living agony in her eye and she was sunk in deep solemn thought when her attention became suddenly roused by observing a chariot and four drive furiously up to the gate while the horses were foaming and panting as they stopped a tall gentleman of exceedingly striking appearance sprung hurriedly out walked rapidly towards the cottage door and in another minute entered frank's room with the animated look of one who expected to be gladly welcomed and to occasion an agreeable surprise harry and laura shrunk close to their uncle when the stranger now in evident agitation gazed round the room with an air of painful astonishment till major graham looked round and instantly started up with an exclamation of amazement edward is it possible this is indeed a consolation you are still in time in time exclaimed sir edward grasping his brother's hand with vehement agitation do you mean to say that frank is yet in danger major graham mournfully shook his head and undrawing the bed curtains he silently pointed to the sleeping countenance of frank which was as still as death and already overspread by a ghastly paleness sir edward then sunk into a chair and clenched his hands over his forehead with a look of unspeakable anguish saying in an undertone worn out as i am in mind and body i needed not this to destroy me say at once brother is there any hope none my dear edward none even now he is insensible and i fear with little prospect of ever becoming conscious again at this moment frank opened his eyes which were dim and glassy while it became evident that he had relapsed into a state of temporary delirium get more candles how very dark it is he said 
who are all these people send away everybody but grandmamma i must speak to her alone never tell papa of all this it would only distress him say nothing about me why do harry and laura never come they have been absent more than a week who took away uncle david too laura listened for some time in an agony of grief till at last unable any longer to restrain her feelings she clasped frank in her arms and burst into tears exclaiming in accents of piercing distress oh frank dear frank have you forgotten poor laura not till i am dead whispered he while a momentary gleam of recollection lighted up his face laura we meet again sir edward now wished to speak but frank had relapsed into a state of feeble unconsciousness from which nothing could arouse him once or twice he repeated the name of laura in a low melancholy voice till it became totally inaudible his breath became shorter his lips became livid his whole frame seemed convulsed and some hours afterwards all that was mortal of frank graham ceased to exist about four in the morning his body was at rest and his spirit returned to god who gave it the candles had burned low in their sockets and still the mourners remained unwilling to move from the awful scene of their bereavement mrs crabtree at length who laid out the body herself extinguished the lights and flung open the window curtains then suddenly a bright blaze of sunshine streamed into the room and rested on the cold pale face of the dead to the stunned and bewildered senses of harry and laura the brilliant dawn of morning seemed like a mockery of their distress many persons were already passing by the busy stir of life had begun and a boy strolling along the road whistled his merry tune as he went gaily on we are indeed mere atoms in the world thought laura bitterly while these sights and sounds fell heavily on her heart if harry and i had both been dead also the sun would have shone as brightly the birds sung as joyfully and those people been all as gay and happy as ever nobody is thinking of frank nobody knows our misery the world is going on as if nothing had happened and we are breaking our hearts with grief laura's heart became stilled as she gazed on the peaceful and almost happy expression of those beautiful features which had now lost all appearance of suffering the eyes from which nothing but kindness and love had beamed upon her were now closed for ever the lips which had spoken only words of generous affection and pious hope were silent and the heart which had beat with every warm and brotherly feeling was for the first time insensible to her sorrows yet laura did not give way to the strong excess of her grief for it sunk upon her spirit with a leaden weight of anguish which tears and lamentations could not express and could not even relieve she rose and kissed for the last time that beloved countenance which she was never to look upon again till they met in heaven and stole away to the silence and solitude of her own room where laura tried in vain to collect her thoughts all seemed a dreary blank she did not sigh she could not weep but she sat in dark and vacant abstraction with one only consciousness filling her mind the bitter remembrance that frank was dead that she could be of no farther use to him that she could have no future intercourse with him that even in her prayers she could no longer have the comfort of naming him and when at last she turned to his own bible which he had given her to seek for consolation her eyes refused their office and the pages became blistered with tears after frank's funeral sir edward became too ill to leave his bed and major graham remained with him in constant conversation while harry and laura did everything to testify their affection and to fill the place now so sadly vacant on the following sunday several of the congregation at hammersmith observed two young strangers in the rector's pew dressed in the deepest mourning with pale and downcast countenances who glided early into church and sat immovably still side by side while mr palmer gave out for his text the affecting and appropriate words which frank himself 
had often repeated during his last illness in an hour that ye think not the son of man cometh not a tear was shed by either harry or laura their grief was too great for utterance yet they listened with breathless interest to the sermon intended not only to console them but also to instruct other young persons from the afflicting event of frank's death mr palmer took this opportunity to describe all the amiable dispositions of youth and to show how much of what is pleasing may appear before religion has yet taken entire possession of the mind but he painted in glowing colours the beautiful consistency and harmony of character which must ensue after that happy change when the holy spirit renews the heart and influences the life it almost seemed to harry and laura as if frank were visibly before their eyes when mr palmer spoke in eloquent terms of that humility which no praise could diminish that benevolence which attended to the feelings as well as the wants of others that affection which was ever ready to make any sacrifice for those he loved that docility which obeyed the call of duty on every occasion that meekness in the midst of provocation which could not be irritated that gentle firmness in maintaining the truths of the gospel which no opposition could intimidate that cheerful submission to suffering which saw a hand of mercy in the darkest hour and that faith which was ever forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of god in christ jesus it seemed as if years had passed over the heads of harry and laura during the short period of their absence from home that home where frank had so anxiously desired to go all was changed within and around them sorrow had filled their hearts and no longer merry thoughtless creatures believing the world one scene of frolicsome enjoyment and careless ease they had now witnessed its realities they had felt its trials they had experienced the importance of religion they had learned the frailty of all earthly joy and they had received amidst tears and sorrows the last injunction of a dying brother to call upon the lord while he is near and to seek him while he may yet be found uncle david said laura one day several months after their return home mrs crabtree first endeavoured to lead us aright by severity you and grandmamma then tried what kindness could do but nothing was effectual till now when god himself has laid his hand upon us oh what a heavy stroke was necessary to bring me to my right mind but now while we weep many bitter tears harry and i often pray together that good may come out of evil and that we who mourn so deeply may find our best our only comfort from above unthinking idle wild and young i laughed and talked and danced and sung and proud of health of frolic vain dreamed not of sorrow care or pain concluding in those hours of glee that all the world was made for me but when the days of trial came when sorrow shook this trembling frame when folly's gay pursuits were o'er and i could dance or sing no more it then occurred how sad twould be were this world only made for me princess amelia end of chapter seventeen end of holiday house